Well, thank you. Uh, I got to begin with just a, a word of thanks. Uh, you know, in 1999, when I came down here, I came in the summer, which is maybe a mistake. Uh, boy, this place is hot in the summer. And uh, I thought, nah, I, I probably am not going back to that place. You know, I'm from Massachusetts. It's cold, right? Um, now, after 24 years, I'm not sure I'd want to go back to Massachusetts because, you know, it's just too cold, OK? Well, thank you. I just want to say thank you to all of you. I want to say thank you to the administration, uh, to the faculty that I've worked with, uh, to all of the staff, and especially to all of the students. Uh, you have made these 24 years absolutely the best 24 years of my life. Uh, I am just so grateful to God uh, for this time that I've had at CIU. Grateful that I'm not completely vanishing, um, but thankful that he's given me such a wonderful time of working with you all. And one of the things that, um, honestly, I've been thinking about this message for a couple of years. Uh, I, I sort of, probably back even before COVID, I was thinking, when it's time for me to leave, you think they'll give me one last shot at chapel? <laughs> and, and if I get to talk at chapel, what am I going to talk about? And uh, God laid a, a topic on my heart, and I went to Dan Coy and said, well, I, I, would you mind me having a final shot at chapel? And, and I gave him my topic, and he said, that's perfect. We'll put it into Christian Unity Week. And I'm thinking, what does this have to do with Christian unity? Mm. And then I realized, actually, this is absolutely fundamental to Christian unity. So what's my topic for today? Uh, my topic is marriage and Christian unity in the context of marriage. And we're going to do a couple of things today that I haven't seen done before, uh, but that's okay. You're not uncomfortable. You're ready for something a little, you know, different than the normal. Uh, we're going to recite our wedding vows together. I've never seen that done in anything other than wedding context. So I thought, you know, let's go through the wedding vows together and think about what they mean from a biblical point of view, but then also from a very pragmatic point of view from, and, and by the way, I, I do love books, and I'm known to give away books, so pay close attention now. Uh, if you get engaged, and even after I have uh, retired, I'll still be hanging around. If you get engaged and you come to me, I will get you a free copy of this book. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by John Gottman. I consider this the best book that's ever been written on marriage because it's totally empirically based. Uh, Gottman put it this way. He said, I have recorded thousands and thousands of hours of individuals who are married interacting. And after doing that and recording absolutely everything that they said and did, I can predict with 95% accuracy, within five minutes of watching a couple interact, who will get married and who will be divorced? Five minutes, that's all it takes. Uh, but the great thing about this book is it gives you all kinds of ways to work together in building your relationship. So, freebie if you get engaged. Now, it's not like I'm trying to get you all to get engaged, all right? But, you know, uh, I want you to have some resources if you do. All right, we're going to begin by looking at marriage as it's described in the Bible. And I want you to think about this fact. Unlike any other religion, and I've studied lots and lots of world religions, I have never found any religion other than Christianity that sets marriage and its concept at the very center of the message. If you think about it, the Bible begins with a wedding, and it ends with a wedding. It begins with a wedding that God himself officiates, and it ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb. And then to make matters even more powerful, it describes the fact that we, the body of Christ, are also the what? The bride of Christ. And that concept is shot throughout the entire scriptures. It's pervasive. And I want you to see some of the differences from that. So we're going to read some scripture passages. We're going to look then at the wedding vows, and by the way, I'm, I've asked Melina Rabin to come up a little later. She's going to lead the ladies in the wedding vows for the ladies, okay? Just so you know why we're going to do it that way. All right, let's begin. Uh, and when I read scripture, I'd like everybody, if you can, to stand. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in this case, 
Uh, later on, I'm going to have you repeat after me, but not on this passage because it's a little bit on the long side. So let me just read this. This is really uh, the first wedding, if you will, in the scriptures where God himself officiates. Genesis 2, verses 20 to 25. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Amen. You may be seated. So let's begin with a bit of a definition here. Uh, What do we mean by marriage? What does marriage mean? mean. Uh, Now, I borrowed a definition here from my good buddy, uh, Bill Larkin. He's home with the Lord. Uh, Bill used to jokingly say something like this. uh, You know, as our culture changes, we have an increasing number of adjectives we need to add to our definition of marriage because our culture is adding all kinds of new ideas to this. But let's take this definition together. What is marriage? It is the joining together of two people in lifelong, monogamous, heterosexual union. This is the lesson of the creation order of Genesis 1 and its specific description in Genesis 2. Now, it doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't describe other kinds of marriage relationships. Uh, When I worked in Bangladesh, one of our first church councils had to deal with the fact of what do we do with polygamists in the church, because many of the people that met Christ in Bangladesh already had multiple wives. What do you do in a circumstance like that? Now, one of the things that I think is clear is this. The Bible may describe many different types of partnerships, sexual relationships, but it never describes any of them as the ideal other than this description. Lifelong monogamous, heterosexual marriage. That is what marriage is. Our culture may try to define it in many more broad ways, but when they do so, it takes it outside of the realm of what the Bible intends for you. So keep that in mind. That's our definition, and again, borrowed from Bill Larkin. One thing I want to say most importantly here, if you think about this, the demands of this, it seems almost absurd, doesn't it? I mean, who can possibly commit themselves at this level? Lifelong. That means I am not going to abandon you ever, no matter what happens. I am going to be faithful to you in every circumstance. That's not a description of a contract, is it? Most religions and most cultures define marriage essentially as a contract, uh, a kind of a tit for tat. I'll do this for you, you did that for me. I've worked a lot with Muslims. Uh, Islamic marriage is stated in all the Islamic law books as a contract. The husband promises this, the wife promises that, and if you don't fulfill your contract, that's grounds for divorce. The Bible does not establish a contractual concept of marriage, but a covenantal form. So what is marriage as a covenantal uh, relationship that is not as a contract? Well, it means certainly this, that I will care for you whether or not you can give anything back. How's that for unreasonable? I will care for you even if you cannot give me anything back. Let me tell you two stories here. Uh, These are not from the Southeast United States. These are friends of mine in other contexts. We're going to keep it anonymous for that reason. First one has to do with uh, a family that was part of my home group uh, a long way from here. And uh, we had the chance to see them as they raised their 
daughter, who was about the same age as our oldest son. And uh, lots of wonderful things happened in that home group. We spent six years together before my family moved down here to, to South Carolina. And um, we watched that uh, young girl grow up. Uh, she became a teenager, then she was in her early 20s. She finished college. And she met a young man, uh, fell in love with him, and he seemed to be a believer in Jesus. So we, uh, with counseling and so forth, we thought, okay, this will be a good marriage. And so uh, he and she were united uh, in marriage. About two years later, their first child uh, was born, a little girl. And we were just really excited, particularly for our friends, because that was their, their first grandchild, and they were really excited uh, about that. And then tragedy struck. Uh, about three months after the baby was born, uh, that young woman came down with meningitis, a, a very serious form of meningitis, uh, infection on the brain. Uh, and uh, it put her into a coma. Uh, she was completely unconscious for about two months in the hospital. And finally, the doctors looking at the brain scans and looking at other stuff uh, told the husband, um, well, we don't think she's going to survive. When we shut off the, uh, you know, the life support stuff, it's likely that she's going to fade away and die. If she doesn't die, she will be a vegetable. She will be in what they call a permanent vegetative state. So what do you do? Well, the young man made his decision, and he took the baby and ran. Nothing more to do with this. I mean, what, what do you want? You want to be married to a vegetable? Who wants that, right? So he took off. I wish you could see a film of that young woman today. Uh, I considered showing you the film, but I thought, no, nah, I probably won't. I, I want to keep this as anonymous as possible. But that young woman, if you could meet her today in church and chat with her, you'd think you were talking with a totally normal person, completely Restored. Now, she does have some disabilities. She does have some permanent scars from what she went through. But her case helps me to understand the doctors often don't know what they're talking about, for one thing. I don't know how many times I've heard doctors saying, you're going to, well, our own Dr. Smith. Everybody said, oh, you're going to be dead, you know. Well, the Lord pulled him through. Sad story, isn't it? He took the baby and ran. Now, there's another uh, couple uh, also two good friends of ours. Uh, they had a daughter, and she got married about five years ago uh, to a young man. Two years into their marriage, he came down with a terminal, what was considered to be a terminal disease that was exceedingly debilitating. Now, you know how that is in our modern society. We try to pull out all the stops for a young person to try to keep them alive, figure out, and they, they did all kinds of stuff new experimental drugs, new kinds of things, and they actually saved his life. He is in a, a permanent remission, looks like he's gonna survive. However, he is severely debilitated and he will probably never work again. And she's there by his side. Now can you imagine as a young woman, maybe in your early 30s, and you're going to be spending the rest of your life with someone who is significantly disabled. Well, she decided, I made that vow, I made that commitment, I'm going to stay with him. So which category are you? Are you going to be the first one to take the baby and run? Or are you going to be the one that says, I'm going to stay faithful to this person and see what God will do? Now, the Christian message calls you to the latter, doesn't it? Unrealistic or what? Well, let's take a look at the wedding vows. I think this would be a good place to start. And here's what we're going to do. I'm actually going to walk the men here through the wedding vows. And then I'm going to have Melina come up and walk the women through the wedding vows. Never seen this done before. And I think the problem with your wedding day is you are so freaked out <laughs> that what you are saying in front of these people with all these hot lights, you hardly even remember let alone have any sort of conception of what sort of promises you're making. So, let's do this at a time when we're not all freaked out and we have a chance to think about what do these vows really mean? Because the vows say they're in keeping with God's word. So we're gonna say the vows together and we're gonna look uh, at some pragmatics 
from John Gottman that illustrate the importance of that particular vow. And then we'll look finally at a scripture passage that helps us to understand why this is a biblical principle. All right? So let's begin. Men, would you all stand? And that includes whether you're engaged or not, whether you're married or not. You can just be single, you know, bachelor till the rapture. That's fine. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to do uh, this together. Now, here's, here's how we're going to do this. Because this is a, a Dave Cash and repeat after me kind of thing, okay? So I'm going to say, in the name of God, and you're going to say, oh, you can do better than that. In the name of God. Okay. And then I'm going to say, I, David, and then you're going to say, I, whatever your name is. Okay. Uh, and then you say, take you, in my case, I'm going to say Margaretha, because I've got a wife named Margaretha. Uh, if you're engaged, you can put that name in there. If you don't have anybody at this point, just extend the U. <laughs> sort of step of faith, all right? Whatever that U might be, all right? So, gentlemen, repeat after me. In the name of God, I, David, take you, Margareta, To be my wife, to, be my wife. To, have to have and to hold from this day forward, this day forward. For, better, for better, for worse, for, worse. for, richer, for richer, for poorer, for poorer. In, sickness in sickness and in health, and in health. To, love and to, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. According to, God's holy word. According to God's holy word. This is my solemn vow. This is my solemn vow. Amen. You may be seated, gentlemen. And now, Melina, thank you so much. If you would lead the ladies in the same vow. All right, ladies, stand up. Is everybody in? Understand the instructions, what we're going to do? Okay. In the name of God, I, Melina, take you, Randy, to be my husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for poorer, in sickness, in sickness and, in health, and in health, to love, to love and, to and to cherish until we are parted by death. Parted by death. According, to God's holy word, According to God's holy word, this is my solemn vow. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Um, we got to get through this in what, 20 minutes? Something like that. All right, so let, let's, let's move quickly here. Let's take a look at each of these uh, different aspects of the wedding vows. The first, of course, is to have and to hold from this time forward. Embracing another person is a lifelong process. Um, I think it was Tim Keller who put it this way. If you're married 50 years, you will be married to five different people over that 50-year period, and they will all be the same person. That's because people change. And one of the things that Gottman points out in Strength of Marriage Relationships is the importance of developing love maps. Now, by love maps, I'm not just talking about the fact that, hey, I, I got to know you and now I know what your favorite ice cream is, which is nice to know. But it's a lot more than that because as you change over time, you are constantly redeveloping and reexamining and understanding anew that person that you're married to. It is a lifelong person or lifelong process of figuring out and understanding each other. Let me just give you a few uh, questions that, are, uh, that, that Gottman has in his book. He says, can I name my partner's best friends? Uh, not just when we were courting, but today, do I know who my wife's best friends are? Do I know those people? Um, can I tell you what stresses my partner is currently facing? Deeply, understanding. Can you tell some of my partner's 
Or can I tell some of my partner's life dreams? Do I know her hopes, her aspirations, her plans for her life? What is the most stressful thing that happened to my partner as a child? Ever gone through that one? Wow, my wife went through something I didn't understand for the first 10 years of my marriage. And here's the funny thing. There are a lot of things that happen to a person when they're little that they more or less forget about from about age 20 to about age 65 or 70. And then suddenly at age 70, that event becomes an immediate and distressing memory, particularly if the people that perpetrated it are now deceased. It's amazing. Do you know what your partner went through in life? I know all the special times in my partner's life. And one of the wonderful things about this book is it'll give you um, questions to ask each other. And I often say to students, don't just read this before you get married. Keep it on the shelf and about every one to two to three years, pull it out and go through it again. Walk through who you are now in your understanding and love maps. To have and to hold from this time forward means I know you exceedingly well. And that brings us to our scripture passage. Would you stand again? And here we're going to do a repeat after me, okay? This is just my way to make sure nobody falls asleep, right? Okay. So uh, let's recite together Ephesians 5.31. Repeat after me. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Amen. You may be seated. Now, we already cited this same passage from Genesis here repeated in Ephesians 5.31. Notice the importance of becoming one flesh. That isn't just a sexual illusion. It is an illusion to the fact that I know you deeply. In fact, for those of you who study Hebrew, you know that the word for sexual intercourse in the Old Testament is the word to know. But it's so much more than just that physical aspect. It's the fact that I know you in depth. I know everything about your life. Uh, when you run the questions in this book past me, I can answer every single one of them correctly. And I want to be able to do that throughout my life, from beginning to end. What does it mean to become one flesh? It means to know one another intimately, deeply, and keeping up with the relentless changes that culture brings. All right, let's go on to the next phrase, for better, for worse. Uh, there will be points in your life when you will be a worse person. I'm in one of those states right now. Um, last three months have been the worst three months of my life. Just horrific. Um, I may not be as sanctified right now as I was five years ago. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hot mess. And um, I'm not retiring because I want to. I'm retiring because I have to. I, I have no choice. I, I can remember um, Bill Larkin, after going through some tough stuff, and talked to him in the classroom. The class had just broken up. We taught together for about 10 or 12 years. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Dave, I can't do this anymore. And he had to retire. Things were just too much. And that's where I'm at. Uh, but it's not something I'm looking forward to in that sense. Uh, I would just soon be here for another 10 years. Uh, but the reality is I have a new set of priorities, a new way of going. So for better, for worse. Um, Gottman puts it this way. How do we deal with contempt? The most acidic thing in a relationship is contempt. How do you deal with contempt? Or some people would say lack of respect, although I think contempt goes quite a bit deeper than just lack of respect. Do you know how to put a positive spin on your life partner? The antidote for contempt is nurturing an attitude of fondness and admiration, even when that person may be at a pretty low point in their lives. And as both my wife and I have been walking through some very low points over the last year, we have been learning the value of fostering admiration. Fostering admiration when there are maybe not as many human reasons to think that that's there. So here are some things that Gottman suggests. 
I can easily list the three things that I most admire about my life partner. My life partner really enjoys my achievements and accomplishments. I can easily tell you why I married my life partner. By the way, you want to know how I met my wife? This is really fun. Uh, I'm walking across the campus of uh, the U.S. Center for World Mission, and uh, one of my buddies signals me. He's got this young woman standing next to him, and, and he calls me over like this. And uh, he introduces this gal. And he says, this is Margareta Lindstrom, and uh, she was a missionary in Iran for four years, selling Bibles to Muslims. Wow, this is a gal with some chutzpah. So you all know what my next question is, right? What's my next question? Somebody said, will you marry me? Well, no, that's, that's a little too quick. Um, my first question to her was, do you speak Persian? Which she did. And I was doing church planting amongst Iranians. And you know, the Lord had said to me, I don't want you to marry anyone who doesn't have a prior calling to work with Muslims. You're not going to drag some poor gal kicking and screaming to the Muslim world, okay? Like some people have done. And here, for the first time, I met a girl who had a prior calling who'd already been out for four years as a missionary. Can you, can you imagine that maybe things started to tick in my brain? <laughs> Boy, friends, I really know uh, why I married my wife. Remember the two stories that I told you at the start. Could you stu still do this if you were in their situation? Could you look at that other person and say, this is why I married you? This is why I love you. This is why I'm going to stick beside you. This is why I'm going to support you. Can you say that? Which one would you be? Let's go on and look at the scripture passage. Please stand again and repeat after me. This is from 1 Thessalonians 5.11. I told uh, Ed I was going to have a 27-point sermon, so we got, we got lots of time here. All right, let's read this. Uh, repeat after me. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. So you've already started on your scripture memory. You may be seated. Building each other up, encouraging each other, even if it points in your life, um, that person isn't quite the way you wish they would be. By the way, I should mention, there are biblical grounds for divorce. I'm not, I'm not one of these people that said there's no reason ever for divorce. Uh, I'm not saying that. But I think our culture has gone berserk in this regard. Uh, had an example of the, this week. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law went on a cruise with a couple from Sweden uh, that they've been good friends with for years. And the wife um, just simply announced on the boat during the cruise that she decided she was going to leave her husband. And we asked the question, why? And she was, well, he's a nice guy. He's really been really good, a nice husband. But, you know, I'm just tired of being with him. I, I want to, you know, I want to have time for me. That's how our culture looks at it. You know, it's like a piece of paper towel. Wipe your hands off and then just throw it away. But that's not biblical marriage, for better, for worse, building each other up. Next, for richer, for poorer. Finances are one of the major stumbling blocks in marriage. Um, you'll probably have more fights over money than almost anything else. So what's the remedy when you're facing that kind of a challenge? Sometimes uh, things don't go well. Sometimes you end up impoverished. Sometimes your great dreams and ideas kind of collapsed. Um, here's the thing. If you're going to have an argument with somebody, that's okay. The key is, when I'm arguing, do I turn towards that person or do I turn away? Friends, one key thing. Uh, there are some books out there that are total garbage. Let me tell you one of them. Uh, it's called... Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that book. That book is total garbage. It has this idea in it that if the man gets upset with his wife, he needs to retreat to his man cave. That's a great way to start your process of divorce. Gentlemen, forget your man cave. When you're having an argument, and by the way, if there's anyone who fails at this, it's me, because I'm a conflict avoidance person. 
I just do not like conflict. And if there's conflict, I want to run away from it. And the reality is that when you run away from it, you are cutting the ties that bind. So the whole question is body language. If I'm in a conflict, do I turn towards the person that I'm committed to or do I turn away? Gottman said that body language will tell you everything about whether that marriage is going to last. Am I willing and do I love you enough that I'll go through the conflict with you and solve it? So, I'm going to hop over some of these points. Let's go to the scripture passage because I want to make sure we've got time to finish and get you to lunch properly. So if you'd all stand, we're going to read uh, Proverbs 19, verse 22. Uh, digging through the scriptures, this one, this one really hit me. This was really something else. Uh, repeat after me. What a person desires, what a person desires is, unfailing love. is unfailing love. Better to be poor than a liar. Amen. Oh, you may be seated. That's Proverbs 19.22. Um, better to be poor than to be a liar. Better to be poor and keep your vow than make your vow a piece of trash and walk away. So, richer or poorer, what everyone needs, husbands, wives, is unfailing love that I don't give up on you, I don't walk away from you because life has dealt us some curveballs. Oh, guess what? Life is going to deal you some curveballs. It's a given. Every single one of you will go through some deep waters. Now, I've been through a few, and right now I'm going through the worst. But that's okay, because I have one person that I'm standing on, and I'm going to tell you about him in just a minute. The reality is what we need is unfailing love, and it's better to be poor than to be a liar. Okay, last two phrases. In sickness and in health, um, there are lots of things in life that we have very little control over. Solve your solvable problems, Gottman tells us. Sickness may not be one of them. Um, we didn't choose the kind of sicknesses we have. My wife has a terminal sickness. That's just reality. I've had a couple of heart attacks and a bunch of other problems. Sickness comes your way. And I guess when you get older, uh, it becomes more obvious. You know, the body just doesn't work like it used to. Um, but that's OK, because that's part of life. And how are we going to be able to support each other if we're not prepared to face the most difficult things that happen in life, in sickness and in health? And one of the things here that I, I think the principle that God would have us understand, and Gottman emphasizes this, is whatever your circumstance, let your partner influence you. Let your partner influence you. Now, I have a wonderful illustration of letting my partner influence me. I've already sort of uh, alluded to that. When I first got the invitation to apply for a permanent position at CIU, you know what my reaction was, South Carolina is too hot. I'm not going down there. And my wife said to me, you know what? I think that place is, is the right place for you and, and for us. Take a, pray about it, consider and uh, at that point, you know, I've learned to respect the advice that my wife gives me and to allow her. And by the way, this needs to be a mutual thing. It isn't all one influencing the other and the other having no influence back. There needs to be a balance there. But allowing that other person to influence the direction of my life. And I have to say that choosing to come down here was the best decision. And I am so grateful to God that my wife put that influence in because she believed she could influence me, and she was right. And her influence was right. So think about that when you're working with a potential life partner. Do you know how to influence one another? Can you allow that person to influence the direction of your life? Stand up again. We're going to just take a real quick verse from Ephesians 5.21. Um, this is the passage that talks about submission. I like to quote this part first because it's talking about mutual submission. That is, that we submit to each other, husbands to wives, wives to husbands. Repeat after me. Submit yourselves, submit yourselves. 
to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5.21. You may be seated. We submit to one another in love. We influence one another in love. We want the best for each other in love. So that part of the vows is fully biblical in the fact that we submit to one another, we encourage one another, we help each other. And that brings us to the final point. To love and to cherish until we are parted by death. Well, from a purely biological perspective, life does not end well. I'm not surprising anybody there. I'm, I'm a little bit closer to that now than most of you. I, I can really understand I, I'm probably not going to be around 20 years from now, and maybe not even 10 years from now. Who knows? Uh, my days are in the hands of the Lord. So biologically speaking, we're all going south. Perhaps that's why God put Christ at the center of marriage. And that's my final point. These promises are impossible for mere human beings to keep. They're just impossible. But the reality is God is the God of the impossible. And he provides in us the power of his Holy Spirit through Jesus in order that we may do the things that our flesh could not accomplish, but God can accomplish in us. God put Christ at the center of marriage, and so therefore, if you'd all stand, our final verse is Ephesians 5.25. Repeat after me. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Ephesians 5.25. You may be seated. The only way that you can have a strong marriage, in my opinion, is by having Christ at the center of that marriage. And before you can do that in marriage, it needs to be true in your personal life as well. So is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he the one that's calling the shots in your life? Is he the one that's leading you? And if you marry a person who has that same total sold out attitude to Jesus, I think the chances are very good that you'll last, unless you happen to die young, you'll last 50 years together. My wife and I are at 43. I'm hoping we'll make it to 50. Uh, that's not a given. But the reality is that Jesus has been the center of our lives for the last 43 years. And he's the one that's enabled us to stay together. Uh, we've been through some tough times, but God has always been faithful. And so as I lead us in prayer, let me just ask this one quick question. Is Jesus the one that you're so totally sold out to you, sold out to, that you be prepared to stay 50 years with someone no matter what they've gone through? That's not a promise you can make in your flesh. That only comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we have been called to love one another and to love our spouses as Christ loved the church and Jesus loved the church by dying for it. Father, who is adequate to these things? But Lord, you are able by your spirit, by the presence of Jesus in our hearts, to make us the kind of people who can be married for 50 and 60 years. So God, begin with me. Begin this work in my life. The challenges are great. Help me this day to make Jesus Lord of all in my heart and life. I want Jesus at the center of my life. And then my prayer is this, that you would lead me to someone where Jesus is the center of their life as well, and where we may glorify Jesus together in a lifetime of service and faithfulness to each other. Lord, we just commit this to you. We pray your blessing upon it. In the name of Christ, amen.